I had to end my month of exploring my new horror slash thriller with a final goodbye to one of my favorite Marvel anti-heroes. Venom and I have grown up together. Spider-Man first got the alien costume that would become Venom when I was six years old. There's a lot to love about Tom Hardy's portrayal of the character, even if I feel like it's not quite comic accurate in many important ways. We have watched this version of the symbiote grow from an alien intent on taking over our world to a trusted friend and guide for his host Eddie Brock. They share a bond that unites them and makes them stronger. It is that bond that the symbiote god Null wants to use to escape his prison. There are several points to this movie that speak to points I've raised in the past, particularly points about the superiority of the moral arguments to the cosmological or teleological arguments. Null may have created the symbiotes and given them an initial purpose, but they were right to imprison him and escape. Also, elements of sacrifice and loss are addressed well in this movie. The recurring character Mrs. Chin gets a special scene with Venom that feels so great. In the end, we all get a chance to say goodbye to our lovable alien symbiote. Although I deeply hope that parts of him that have shed over the years will find their way back to Eddie, if this really is the last time we see him, it is a satisfying and welcome end to a beloved character. Finding the right way to see off a character can be a difficult process as a writer. Killing off a character too completely too soon can be a mistake as Sir Arthur Conan Doyle learned when he killed off Sherlock Holmes only to bring him back a bit later. But if the story seems to be over, what do you do with that? With my latest book, I wanted to leave open the idea that there could be other stories yet to be told about the characters I've created, but I needed the current story to end. Here I'll lay out the end of the story, and you can judge how well I did. That's when Chuck knocked on my door. I opened it up. Julia was standing just behind him as the rain poured down on them. Could we borrow a plug-in for a moment? He asked. Our car broke down just up the road, and our phones are out of batteries. He held up the phone with a blank screen to make the point. Yeah, come on in, I said. Chuck gently slid past me, and Julia was right behind him. She smiled at me sheepishly as she thanked me for my hospitality. Chuck ran his hand down the pink jacket hanging at the door, then put his hand on the bike. Oh, wow! This looks impressive, he said, then walked past. Julia stopped, examining the coats and various children's toys at the entrance. Yeah, my son is into BMX, I said. I led him to an outlet at the wall, and he plugged the phone in. I suppose if I had been paying attention, I would have noticed that it wasn't charging. Chuck stood up. Let's just leave that there for a moment. Let it do its thing. Then he walked to the fireplace. Oh, is this your son? He asked, looking at a family photo. Yeah, I guess, I said. I mean, it's all of us. Then he turned to the next picture. And a spare picture of the family. I wouldn't think of them as spares, I said. They each show something unique. He smiled at the three trophies. The ballerina, the karate guy, and the biker. This must be for the BMX you were talking about. And a spare trophy, too. I smiled, proud to brag about my boy for a moment. Yes, indeed, I said. And I was about to start into the whole story when he stepped right into Julia's face. She had been examining the first photo very carefully. She looked up into Chuck's eyes, then started shaking her head violently. I need to go check on Fate and Liz, he told her. No. Oh, hell no. You can't just leave me here. What if? Chuck just smiled. Roger here is going to make sure you're safe. Julia swallowed hard. There's a lot of assumptions built into that particular scenario that I don't agree with, she said. Chuck turned to me. You know, I don't have a lot of spares in my life. Most of what I have, I only have one of. Take Julia here as an example. She's my only friend in the whole world. She keeps me, 
Let's just say she keeps me grounded. Because of her, I don't give in to my darkest impulses. I think that if something tragic were to happen to her, I might do something that other people would regret. Chuck looked over his shoulder to Julia. She let out a sigh and said, I'm not staying here while you go back there, Chuck. Then Chuck turned to leave, ignoring her. Julia followed at first, but Chuck raised a finger behind him, then pointed at the trophies. Julia took a breath. She looked back at the trophies and started examining the pictures very carefully. Chuck smiled at me. You see this woman here? She is my trophy. If anything were to happen to her, I might do something rash, like destroying a spare. Then he walked out the door. As he closed the door, Julia cocked her head to one side inquisitively. Then all in an instant her eyes went wide, and she yelled to me, Call an ambulance! Now! Where's your daughter? She started swearing in rapid succession, as I led her up to my daughter's room. We ran to my daughter's bedroom together. She was thrashing in her bed and foaming at the mouth when we burst in. The dispatcher was just picking up the phone. Julia sighed in relief. We're not too late. Just tell them not to dawdle with that ambulance. Julia took my daughter's hand. She's coming out of it. Do you have any sugar in the house? Candy? Ice cream? Anything sweet? I told her there was ice cream in the freezer. She told me to wait with my daughter while she went to the kitchen. She was back in record time with a carton of ice cream. It wasn't fast enough. Just before she came back in, my daughter's eyes rolled back into her head, and she started thrashing again. Julia pushed the carton of ice cream into my hand, shouting, Hold this! Before grabbing my daughter's hand. Is she going to be okay? I asked. A stream of curse words came out of Julia's mouth. Then she took a deep breath, took my hand. I'm sorry. It's just, he promised not to do this anymore. If she makes it through the night, then this time tomorrow it will be like nothing happened. The dispatcher told me that the paramedics were at the door. I ran down and let them in. Julia was yelling at them that my daughter needed sugar. They took a pulse, and my daughter started to come out of it. Julia pushed past the paramedics to force a spoonful of half-melted ice cream into my daughter's mouth. My daughter recoiled as though it was bitter. One of the paramedics let out a gasp, and the other looked at the test. They turned to me. Sir, is your daughter hypoglycemic? What? No. Sir, your friend here is right. Her blood sugar levels are dangerously low. The lowest I've ever seen. A bag within four was attached to my daughter's arm, and in a matter of minutes, the ambulance was headed to the hospital. Julia rode with me, and we followed. So I had a few minutes to ask her questions. At the hospital, Julia told me this basic outline of the story. She filled in every gap I asked about over the next two weeks. Just as Julia had promised, my daughter was back to normal the next day. The hunter terrified me. He had all but promised to return and finish the job if anything happened to Julia. I watched her like a hawk during the day. When my kids were at their mother's house, Julia was rarely more than an arm's reach away. Then, about two weeks later, I woke up one morning to find that I was alone in the house. I don't know if dark night came for her, or if death returned and took her, or if she just left on her own. All I know for sure is that my daughter hasn't been harmed, but she also hasn't quite been the same. She has had a shorter temper, kept longer grudges, and has occasional blackouts. Then last week, a doctor saw my daughter when we were at the grocery store and gave me his card. I called the office, made an appointment, and my daughter and I sat in his office for an hour, telling him everything we knew. Then another man we hadn't noticed sitting in the shadows spoke up. What makes you think it's the same thing? Trust me, the doctor said. This girl has the hunter. The man in the shadows shifted uncomfortably. 
He didn't say anything about the mini mart incident or the thing at that one school, but he described Alexander's situation perfectly. The bodyguards that turned on him, the strange woman that kept visiting, and then the suicide. Do you really think that strange woman was fate? The doctor shrugged. I know how to find out. The man in the shadows shook his head. If what you're suggesting is right, my former partner has an enemy that we need to find and join forces with. We need to try to track down this fate. And looking for Sarah Macbeth sounds like it might not be entirely fruitless, either. A police officer came out of the shadow. My daughter smiled the way she does when she's blacking out. I recognize you, she said. The officer was unfazed. You're free to leave. Thank you for your cooperation.